Welcome to World of Monsters. Today, we got a great show packed for you. You, I have laid dormant for two weeks. Who dares disturb my... Uh, hi, Arthur. There we go. Unique takes on classic monsters. That is our topic today. I will do my shares and then we'll jump in the Discord and show what you guys are sharing for this topic discussion. I would like to share, it's not a great share, but I did watch it, so I will share it. And that is Warm Bodies. And I believe it's sort of a, to me, it was a unique take on the whole zombie thing. More so the whole zombie thing rather than a zombie because there's not that much of uniqueness that you can do with the zombie i mean we have infected and stuff like that but with the whole zombie usual idea that you have in movies is they're not very self-aware they just walk around eat brains stuff like that i'm going to shout out a couple things and then it, it it ends very quickly there i'm not going to cover it that much as that's not my main share for the unique uh take the movie starts out decent the way it starts is you have this zombie it starts with him telling you what he's thinking so he's not talking he's just strolling like the other zombies this is all just a place populated by zombies and he's telling you what he's thinking but he can't really do much with it physically but it's still in his head he has a friend that he mentions this uh, other zombie and he'll sometimes go to him and grunt and i thought that was a, a cool intro because we never see that side right when you see zombies it's just quiet and you hear gr you know snarling and and their grotesque noises but with this you could hear what he's thinking and and everything and and how it's like out of sight of his control like a real disorder i thought that was cool to something that went downhill pretty quick it also hit on why they like to eat brains i believe it was return of the night of the living dead where the zombie mentioned why it likes to eat brains I always thought that was pretty cool. In this movie, that happens as well. Uh, he does bring up why they like to eat brains. And I thought that's pretty cool too, because they like to eat brains because when they eat the brain, it gives them the memories of that dead person. So it gives them a little bit of life, a little bit of a spark that they don't have anymore. So they yearn for that and they hunger for that. If they don't eat the brain, that person that dying person, dead person will turn into a zombie as well. So that also gives them a way, a reason, a purpose to not eat the brain so they can spread and have other zombies around them so they can keep walking around. And that's literally mostly what they do or the movie says they should be doing, but then it changes. The movie quickly becomes quite contrived and breaks many of its own rules. That's why I'm saying that beginning segment was cool, but then you're like, okay, I thought they can't do this. I thought they don't do this. If they can do this, why weren't they doing this? That kind of thing. And you just start questioning and that's just, you know, crap you're writing. So still interesting take on the life of the unlife as a zombie. I thought that's cool because I've never seen that anywhere else. Uh, I've seen a zombie just reply to why it eats brains or or that. You've never seen their reality, their life, because they don't have a life. Or they have an odd life. I would recommend the first 20 minutes. After that, it's your call. My main unique monster take will be on Dracula. Dracula I, on say, I love that movie. Night of the Living Dead. It releases the pain. Yes, it releases the pain. That's why they eat brains. That's what they said in that movie. The Night and the Return. Love the effects. Absolutely. They're coming to get you, Barbara. <laughs> All right. So Classic. now with the Dracula Untold 2014, it's rated 6.2 in IMDb. Again, I don't care too much for ratings, but when I do look at ratings, I'm okay with IMDb ratings because those are people ratings. So it's just a, a numbers, a survey kind of rating. And I'm okay with that. At least we're getting ratings from real people. So usually IMDb is more of a safe bet. Before watching the movie, from which, seeing how people love this movie, I was like, okay, 6.2 is a little low. But after I watched it, I, I honestly, I, I get it. But let's jump into the uniqueness of this Dracula take. So he's a tough king, and he was one of 1,000 boys where another kingdom would take like 1,000 boys from another kingdom to help them fight. And he was one of the 1,000 that survived. So later he requires, in short, I'm not going to get a, a, this is in a movie review, he requires power to save his kingdom. So he requires some more strength because he's overwhelmed by this other leader. So where does he go to get those powers you can imagine? There is a master vampire. And it is my favorite character in this movie. 
and that is what Chris has been bringing up. The gentleman that also played, uh, who was it, Chris? Tywin Lannister. I'm going to say, uh, despite his um, questionable deeds, the most badass old man in that series. Maybe second yeah. to Blackfish, maybe. But uh, that's for all you peeps who recall the good seasons of the show or have read the books he was one of the coolest vampire renditions i've seen on the big screen so to speak creepy and nothing overdone there uh just an old creepy guy that's powerful and he's got the face he's got the lines in the movie he has some of the better lines as far as writing is concerned i really like his character now back to the the actual dracula untold so he gets bitten he becomes uh a vampire for three days if he doesn't feed on blood permanently if he does so anyway that increases his power that was a cool part in the movie where you see him gain his speed his power his senses his smell his sight his hearing that all goes up love to see that in the movies not enough of that shown in this one among his powers is instead of turning into a bat and shifting or a big monster bat he turns into a flock a, a big a swarm of bats when he moves around high speed hence you always see these images with the cape looking like so that's actually it's a pretty cool concept and uses that a lot when he battles i really wanted to like this movie because i saw there's like a strong following to it when i was reading comments and stuff but the last quarter of the movie really starts to fall and things just happen out of conveniency and and you're like well, how did they get there why is she not dead immediately uh things like that happen and it's just like okay it just got lazy because there was a lot of money and care put into the movie the, the scenes, the costume uh, work was excellent. It's very nicely produced, big budget film that, you know, when they start to skimp on stuff at the end, just, you know, it, it's sad to see that. The last fight was BS. I mean, it was like a kryptonite situation, but just I wasn't happy with that. I'm not going to give spoilers away. So it, as far as the movie, in short, it had potential, in my opinion. Um, I believe an extended director's cut of this movie would do it justice. I would love to see, I think it would make it a good movie, except for some parts where you just can't make it a good movie with that, like that boss fight or, or certain conveniency factors. Even if you increase the length of the movie and like good storytelling, you still have those crappy points. So they really did ruin it for it. But I still think an extended version of it would be great. I quite enjoyed the uh, take on Dracula in that movie, as it was a bittersweet ending in the end, considering that we're moving into the modern day. And I guess that was prime sequel material. I very much so would have been curious uh, what will take place in the future with a Dracula being in a more modern setting. On one side, I was hopeful for that, and I'm sad we haven't gotten a sequel. On the other, I... I think I am glad there isn't because they would have probably just made it the modern day again be in the United States and uh, nothing against the United States, but it would have been a nice to see. It still would be nice to see a movie take place in modern day locations where they're supposed to be. So in Dracula's case, maybe modern day Romania. In a bit of a twist of fate, uh, in the previous monster cast, I sang the glories of how better it was to be a vampire than a werewolf. But in terms of a unique take on the classic monster, I am I am a bit of a sucker for this particular rendition of your classic werewolf, namely the skin wolf from Warhammer Fantasy. Unlike other types of werewolf, this is indeed a curse, though it is more specific as it is a type of mutation. It's most common among the northern reaches of the old Warhammer world, where humanity tends to congregate around the places where the power of chaos and the ruinous powers simply seeps into the land. There exist many cases of blighted mutations inflicted upon those that have come into contact with the ruinous powers, and while many are outwardly visible as some kind of stigmata intended to either attract the admiration of other followers of chaos and repel their enemies with fear, some hide away inside the body and on the bearer's blood, such as the case with our subject in question, the infamous skin wolves of dire legend. The skin wolf's curse is a mutation that causes normal humans affected by it to turn into tall, lean monstrosities of twisted bodies ending in elongated limbs with scythe-like claws, which are half-mindedly feral and insane, guided by a ravenous hunger for warm flesh. 
by this description and their dwelling in the dark woods of the world, a more learned monsterite may equate them to uh, what we know as a Wendigo, but uh, more less so than a werewolf, though I guess this is another point of a classic monster take. But there are a number of features that distinguish them from the cannibals of Native American myth. Primarily, their most notable feature being that the large elongated canine head, reminiscent of the large wolves that uh, scour the Warhammer world, clothed in flesh rather than with an exposed skull. And then we uh, come to their signature physical trait, which is where their name comes from, skin wolves, is that when a, a, the, a trigger happens that causes the mutation to inflame itself, so to say, uh, the wolf monstrosity will literally tear its way out of the human host's body, similarly to how uh, it was done in the 2004 film Van Helsing, the way the werewolves transformed in there, but it's significantly more visceral, and what comes out is less symmetrical and more so mangled and twisted to the point where its every movement would be its bones would be impaling it on the inside and its movements would be causing it physical pain but its great regeneration prevents it from doing so and the reason why it is um worse in my opinion than what happens in van helsing is because it is a more feral type of transformation the beast within doesn't wait at all it is so ravenous to go out and hunt it doesn't wait to fully come out of its host so what you can see clearly on this piece of artwork the transformation, even when it's fully complete, the beast doesn't fully remove all of the patches of skin of its host that were left on it, and so it just is left draped in these rags of bloody pieces of tissue and skin that give it its signature name Skin Wolf, as it has the these drips of skin hanging off of it at all times. Of course, once it is done feasting and it satisfied its blood hunger, eventually the human itself also rips its way out of the uh, monster's body, returning to a to its sane life, oftentimes not remembering what has happened. A particular detail that makes them unique, the most common thing about chaos mutations is how random and varied they are, but the skin wolf one is very uniform, where you always turn into this wolf-like bestial monster that is twisted and in constant pain, but capable of great speed, strength, and regeneration. But seeing such a perversion of what your god stands for charging at you and not stopping regardless of how much steel is slashed or shot into it, it's a pretty nasty thing to break your morale regardless of dedication. You guys can join these things through Discord. You can join and watch via YouTube. But I organized a way here so that if you're on mobile phone and you want to watch the stream and comment on the Discord and post pictures, you are able to do that. And this, this is how. But this is one way to do it so that even mobile people can enjoy this whole stream. I heard of the movies uh, Jack Frost, the one with the serial killer that's a mutant snowman. All right. Oh, those are pretty unique. They're, and they're also like the horror comedies. See, there is a series called Where World. I don't suppose any of you have heard of it. And yes, I must tend to the Forsaken Brood mine. And we have uh, JMPF uh, sharing us a image of the Where World. So in Where World, there are plenty of types of werewolf sorts of creatures and all they're all in their own cliches and clans. The species all take traits from their animal type, there are even a were mammoth. Very cool. I mm. want to see that. The unique take is that they can't pass on the type with a bite or anything. So Warmouth. werewolf is a so if, uh, a world where there's all manner of were creatures, not just werewolves. Oh, <clears throat> right. And seems better than anamorphs. <laughs> <laughs> Truly, I saw blessing. the animal series a while back. It was. Interesting. There are a wild and reviled group of possible cannibalistic tribesmen. One of the their shaman takes a severed hand and one of the last werewolves and creates a curse for them to use that actually acts akin to a classic werewolf curse. It's unique in my mind because all of the world building behind it leads you to expect other things. There's neat magic stuff that shows up as well as besides that other dar ritual. And they end up having one of the few human characters contract that curse. All of them can be poisoned by wolvesbane and have have a weakness to silver by the way and as a side note i do recall there being claims that one of the side characters being one of the first openly homosexual were creatures in the literature um okay uh, need to know that's cool one of the first huzzah to that we like first 
I'm trying to make you bigger, Chris, but it's not letting me. So I'm just going to kind of poke you around and manhandle you. I hope you like it. I'm reminded of that video where someone grabs a rat and is like, you're my friend now. We're going for soft tacos today. Aw. Okay, when there are we, we gonna go. go for soft tacos, Arthur. I'm ready anytime, Chris. Let's uh, let's figure out this uh, distance situation. We do have JMPF if you yes, um, yes, scroll up, you Arthur. Uh, so he shared the Shadow of the Vampire is a 2000 fictionalized account of the making of the classic okay. vampire film Nosferatu, Eine Symphonie des Guares. Graunens. I don't know how to speak German, I'm sorry. Uh, in which uh, Max Schrechter is an actual vampire, which means some bitty bits were actually so. Uh, that is, oh, that is actually hilarious. So a movie about the making of a vampire movie where the main actor is actually a vampire. Oh, that's an adorable idea. It, it tickles my charm. Yes, it does. I didn't know that's what I, I know of the movie. I haven't seen it. I didn't know that's the premise. That's excellent. I'm going to have to put it on my watch list. It made me think of uh, what other movie is the protagonist a vampire while interviewing it with a vampire, um, which is also kind of a unique take on classic monsters, the whole movie in and of itself, because it shows how he has to struggle through being a vampire. But Interview with a Vampire is one of my, my top dark movies. I absolutely love that movie. I'm surprised nobody brought up any of the unique takes on Frankenstein because there are some really good ones out there. I saw a more modern one that looked kind of decent. There's even an older one that's pretty good. I don't know how unique the take was. I just remember the actor that played him. It wasn't that big, goofy, green Universal's Frankenstein, but more of a realistic looking one, right? But it was a good movie. All right, thanks again for supporters there. There we go. A toast, huzzah, Chris, huzzah, everybody, to a better, to a great 2023. Chris, when we have testicle difficulties, our, our views go up. You might you might notice that. So we need that to is work. mildly concerning. That's <laughs>